Cap is a biblical archaeologist and historian. This book historically documents the whereabouts of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from his early teens until he was approximately 30 years of age. The Traditions of Glastonbury records facts that prove Jesus and Mary's uncle, Joseph of Arimathea, traveled to the British Isles. Yeah. The Shepherd's Chapel also Shepherd's makes Chapel. this documentary available on DVD DVD. video. That's right. Uh -huh. The Traditions of Glastonbury on DVD <clears throat> is our item 46651, and the suggested donation is $25. That's right. Only. Whether you order the book or the DV, you will enjoy sharing this fascinating Maybe. work with family and friends over and over again order your copy of traditions of glastonbury, glastonbury. today okay. Okay. okay that's enough for you buddy that's enough okay How you, how's everybody doing i'll probably comment on what i was listening to a little later keep praying for me in jesus name yeah, how about father so how did that go tis I don't know how to pronounce your name, but I'm not going to try to. So keep coming in with these very baffling, confusing names and then get upset when I mispronounce them. All right. So Tizda, Christian grape juice. Okay. What's going on? Shlama Huni from Okay. Shlama Aziza. Shlama Tmaran Isham Shikha. Allah Al Kullan. Father, Son, and Spirit, we love you. Father, Son, and Spirit, in Jesus' name. I'll begin in a word of prayer in a minute. So I'm going to probably share this with you at the end. And the reason why I want to share it with you, first of all, pray that God blesses us in the power of the Holy Spirit and bless this internet connection in Jesus' name that it doesn't act up. Please, my Father, Lord Jesus, Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and I'll begin an intense prayer in a minute. But I'll mention something came up again. Um, uh, it's tiring, brethren. I had received good news yesterday. Glory to Jesus Christ. I'll, I'll be planted where I'm at for a long time and the foreseeable future i'm going to be living here they approved but then something came up that it's just tiring me out it's and i'll mention a little later really really i'm getting tired and i really need jesus christ and his infinite love just to miraculously destroy these obstacles remove them completely so i can just focus on him right and i'll mention it during the end of the session Knowing that people are going to hear this and they're going to be rejoicing because they're praying for my destruction and downfall, which is to be expected. As I said yesterday, I'm not going to draw everyone to myself. I'm not going to make everybody happy. And they're going to be people who can't stand me because they think I'm a nasty, arrogant jerk. And that's fine. You know, there are preachers out there, teachers out there that I can't stand either. But that's just the way it is, right? So, but anyway... I'm going to let you know at the end. It's tiring. It's November 20th. Again, another major obstacle that if the Lord Jesus doesn't intervene, it just, you know, I'm tired. Anyway, uh, Colin, there are a lot of people. I've had people claiming to be Christian who tell me, see, this is God's judgment. He's chastening you. He's rebuking you because you're an arrogant, you know, wicked, <clears throat> foul-mouthed Christian and you know, your ex-wife did what she did because you deserve it. Yeah, many people. Colin. Don't worry, Andrew, in your heart, you know God exists. It's just a matter of time before you swallow your pride and just say, Jesus, you are Lord. And some of them feel hurt. It's not necessarily jealousy. Some of them feel hurt because I've either rebuked them harshly and they don't like that. Because, again, we live in an age where you have, listen, folks, this is the honest truth. We live in an age where Satan is working powerfully through the judicial system, through the political system, the economic system, the educational system to <clears throat> masculinize women and feminize men. Men have become effeminate. Men are afraid to be men. Women have become men. <clears throat> women are being elevated, emboldened, the masculinization of women and the feminization of men, which is why you have such hatred towards masculinity and why you have, in all honesty, such a high divorce rate. Right? When you defy God and oppose God and go against God's order and structure and how things 
should be, especially when it comes to family. When the woman becomes the man in the relationship and the man becomes the woman, that doesn't last. Okay, he can tell you what he wants. That's between him and God. What's that got to do with me, Christian grape juice? Right? So your pastor, you know, said that. And what does that got to do with me? I'm not, he's not my pastor. I don't go to his church. Yeah, it's it's sad, man. It's sad. Men are afraid to be men now. Men are afraid to be men, really. And brethren, I can testify for firsthand experience. The judicial system, the legal system is anti-men. It wants to destroy men. It wants to destroy men. And it even rewards wicked, immoral, adulterous, filthy women. It rewards them. <clears throat> right? So, but I'm tired of this legal system. And it, it, it just, as Satan would have it, as Satan would have it, I have the most corrupt judge in the world. Now, even saying this, I can get in trouble because those who hate me can then show this to the judge who already hates me, thinks I have a money tree and that money grows on trees for me. The most wicked, man-hating, filthy, wicked whore of Satan against me. Here, let me give you the link. Here, let me show it to you so you know I'm not making it up. Okay. I really need a miraculous intervention of the living God, the triune God, Father, Holy Spirit, to deal with this woman, to chasten her like the dog that she is, and guard my heart, maintain my integrity. Here it is. Check it out so you know I'm not lying. That's the person. She has destroyed so many other men that I know, even a close friend of mine, which I won't mention his name. Destroyed us, really. Right? So keep praying because I'll mention it at the end. Yeah. Sorry, guys. I'm just a little tired. Honestly, I'm a little tired, drained, frustrated because of the news I got yesterday. I'm tired. I'll be honest. Jesus Christ is my God. He's our God. When I say my God, I speak on behalf of every one of us. He's our God. He's our Lord. He's our life. He's our <clears throat> source of of peace, love, joy. He sustains us. He's our Savior, Redeemer. And he's the one who gives us the power and the strength because we cannot do it without Jesus Christ, right? Okay? So anyway, let's begin. Let me ask the Lord to bless and we'll begin. Vine, good to see you. Good to see every one of you. All the regulars, you know who you are. I love you for the sake of Jesus. And I thank Jesus for putting grace and favor in your hearts to put up with me in my imperfections and forgiving me <clears throat> when I exceed the limits. So I pray that the Holy Spirit will constrain me for the glory of Jesus, not to be unnecessarily offensive, to fill me with more patience and kindness towards everyone, especially you, the household of God, and that the Lord Jesus will transform us for his glory, right? So let's just tell the Father that we love him. I'll pray <clears throat> on our behalf. So <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure... You will amen with me as I enter the presence of our God. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. We worship you, Father. We worship your Son, the Lord Jesus. We worship your Holy Spirit, Father. Father, we just want to praise you for who you are, not just for what you've done for us. Even if you were to give us nothing but wrath and judgment, that's what we deserve, and you would still be worthy of all praise for who you are. You are God. Jesus, your son, would be worthy of all praise for who he is. Your Holy Spirit would be worthy of praise and worship for who he is because you are God. And yet still, <clears throat> you bless us with blessings and preserve us in your infant love that we don't deserve. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord Jesus. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Father, I'm, I'm tired today, but I depend on you. We all depend on you. We depend on the Lord Jesus. We depend on the blood of Jesus to cover us, to wash us, to purify us, and our loved ones, to cover and purify and wash even my daughters and the holy blood of Jesus. And we depend on the life and power from your Holy Spirit. Energize our entire beings, every part of us, Father, spiritually and emotionally, psychologically, physically. We need your power, your grace, your love. We need endurance from you, Father from the Lord Jesus, from your Holy Spirit, Lord. 
Bless your persecuted church as we speak. There are brothers and sisters in Christ who are being imprisoned right now, Lord. We're being tortured and beaten and even enslaved and violated. And yet by the power of the Holy Spirit living in them, they do not recant. They do not deny Jesus because they know their afflictions is temporary. It's momentary. And awaiting them is everlasting glory where they will bask. We will all bask. We will be flooded in your infinite love and joy and peace forever and ever. And no more pain, no more suffering, no more misery, no more death. Help us, Father. Lord, please help me. Your servant is tired emotionally, but I trust in you and I depend on you and I need you. We love you. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, anoint me to speak truth without error. Enable me to recall the passages and interpret them perfectly and save me from stammering and confusion and anoint the sound of my voice, Holy Spirit, to be pleasing to the ears of your servants. Fill us all with wisdom and knowledge, understanding from your glorious presence to understand the word. And to live it out for the glory of Jesus, that Jesus will increase in us. We'll be more like the Lord Jesus and less like us in the world. And fill my lungs and my throat and my chest with health, with the breath of life, Holy Spirit. Life from you. And save us from the attacks of the enemy. Have your way, Holy Spirit, please. Have your way. We love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In the Father, Holy Spirit. In the Father, Holy Spirit. All right, <clears throat> I'm going to finish off where we left off yesterday. Lord willing, I'm going to finish what the expression firstborn means in ref reference to our Lord Jesus Christ, what it doesn't mean. Pray for the internet connection, and let's just begin. Hopefully, we'll get close to 200 people. I want to see a 1,000 for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, <laughs> You know, I'm laughing, right? This, I believe he's a brother in the Lord because he amen me, but uh, look at the name. Mastur, and then he has Bates. I don't know what to say. Oh, boy. What do I say? And he amen. So obviously he's a brother in Christ, but what do you, what do, you do with him? <laughs> you see, I'm so... I'm so drained that in my frustration, I'm laughing. It's okay. I mean, you said amen, so I'm trusting your brother in Christ. But, brother, can I give you uh, some brotherly advice? Change that name because if you're going to glorify Jesus Christ and people see that name, I'm going to take your word for it that you're not, you know, a troll. But do change your name, friend. I mean, because, see, I, you threw me off. You really did with that name. I'm looking, I said, are you serious? But he said, amen. So I'm trusting you're not a troll, but friend, please, please just change that name, right? Because you do have sisters here as well. Let's honor and respect our sisters in Jesus Christ, right? For their sake, for the sake of our sisters who love Jesus, right? Okay, with that said, let's continue where we left off. I'm going to explain the term firstborn. We will use, for the most part, the Jehovah Witness Bible, but... There are places in which I'm going to have to use other versions in order to show you where the Jehovah Witness Bible butchered the Greek, did not accurately translate the Greek of the New Testament, right? Are, are we ready? Thank God for last is here. I didn't see Protestant believer. Is he here? <clears throat> yeah, Colin, I, I believe first last is here, so he may be able to do that. Unless Protestant believers, I didn't see. Okay, so first last, you'll be able to do it? If you guys want to read along, first of all, here's my article. Let me repost the article. This is the basis for my discussion today. Okay. Okay. Again, save that link. Go and read because I'm going to be using this as a base. <clears throat> okay. But if you want to read the New World Translation online, here's the link. The New World Translation online. Here is the link. Here you go, guys. Right? This shows you all the available Bible translations on the Jehovah's Witness website. This is the official website of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And if you click on that link, they do us a favor because they have posted online for free the various editions of their Bible perversion. 
as well as their Kingdom Interlinear Translation of the Greek Scriptures. It's right there on the main page. They also published the American Standard Version, the Bible and Living English, and guess what? The King James Version. Did you know that? It's all there on that link. Let me post the link again. Did you guys know that up until the 1950s, do you know what the official Bible version of the Jehovah's Witnesses happened to be? See, again, a distraction. Watch here. Let's see. Hello. Who is this? Anybody home? See? All right. Hello. This year. Anyway, King James Version, exactly. <laughs> they used the King James Bible as their chief translation until they realized they needed their own perversion of the scriptures because the King James was proving to be a nightmare to their position. The reason why is because they couldn't convince you that Jesus is a God or deny the Trinity because in the King James Bible, the very passages that the New World Translation butcher and mistranslate in reference to the deity of Christ or the Trinity are the very passages which the King James Version shouts out, Jesus is God Almighty in, in the flesh. So they realized they couldn't successfully brainwash people using the Jehovah, uh, the New King James. Ah, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue. Holy Spirit, protect me from error. That they couldn't brainwash people using the King James, so they had to come up with their own translation. Now, do you guys know why, if you go on their link here, they have the American Standard Version? They actually published the American Standard Version. That's one of the translations they use to compare with their translation. Does anyone know why? Why the American Standard Version? Well, do you know why they use it? Because the American Standard Version retains the divine name Jehovah in every one of its occurrences in the Hebrew Bible. The word Jehovah appears about 7,000 times, approximately 7,000 times in the Hebrew Bible. And the American Standard Version doesn't render the divine name, what's known as, again, remember this. Guys, pay attention. I'm trying to educate you. Trust the Holy Spirit will save me from error. The divine name is, is made up of, consists of four consonants, four consonants, because there weren't vowel markings in the original Hebrew Old Testament. They were added later on after the time of the Lord Jesus Christ. These four consonants are known as the <clears throat> tetragrammaton, tetragrammaton, tetra four grammaton letters. In Hebrew, they are yod, he, vav, he, yod, he, Vav He, where we get Yahweh or Yahovah, or some like to say Yod He, Wow He, Yahweh. Now, in most English translations, they render the divine name as Lord in all capital letters capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When you see all caps in the English translation of the Old Testament, that's an indication by the translators that in the Hebrew, the divine name appears. Yod, He, Vav, He. Now you have some translations that just rendered as Yahweh or Jehovah. The American Standard Version renders it as Jehovah in all 7,000 places, approximately 7,000 times, right? Now there are instances in which the Hebrew has Adonai, Yahovah. Adonai, Yahovah. Now Adonai typically is translated as Lord. In those cases, when it's Adonai, Yahovah, most of the English translations will either render it as Sovereign Lord, and Lord all capitals, capital O, capital, <clears throat> capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, as the Holy Spirit saves me from error, Sovereign Lord, or they'll render it as Lord God, like the NIV does, and place God in all capitals. So in the NIV, when you see in the Old Testament the word Lord and God in all capitals, capital G, capital O, capital D, that's an indication by the translators of the NIV that in the Hebrew it's Adonai Yahovah. Are you with me there? So let me repeat again, and I'm going to spell it out because I want to educate you. I don't want to bore you. 
But I'm not here to entertain you. I want to educate you with the most accurate information possible as the Holy Spirit enables me to be accurate and to bless you. Okay. In the English translation of your Old Testament, when you see the word Lord, all capitals, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, that's an indication that in the Hebrew, it's a divine name. yod He vav He Yahovah. Sometimes, though, the word God is all capitals, capital G, capital O, capital D. That's an indication that it's the word God. That's the rendering of the divine name, yod He vav He is that clear? Is everyone with me there? Let me give you an example. No, Orthodox, it's not clear to you. You dropped the ball. You were not even paying attention. Who told you when the word God is all capitals, it's Elohim? I just said when the word God is all capitals, that means in this place, the divine name Yod He Vav He is being rendered as capital G, capital O, capital D. Where did you get that when God is all capitals, it's Elohim or Adonai? Audhu Billah. Do I need to repeat this again? Okay, one more time. At times, your English translation will render the divine name Yahovah, Yod He Vav He, as Lord in all capitals. At times, they will render the divine name yod He vav He Yahovah as God in all capitals. Anytime you see the word Lord or God in all capitals, that every letter is capitalized, that's because they're indicating to you they're rendering the divine name either as Lord or God. Did it make sense now? You guys getting it or no? Okay, and now I'm going to give you an example that with this in mind, first last is going to use the King James here. With this in mind, let's see how many of you are going to get it. You're going to see a translation that uses two different words for Lord. Let me repeat it again. This verse uses two different words for Lord. One is the divine name, yod He vav He. The other is Adon, Adon, which typically means Lord, Master. Let's see if you spot the difference. Let's see. Here's a test that you guys are paying attention for the sake of the Lord Jesus, not because you like the sound of my voice. You're paying attention because you want to learn. I'm going to now have first last cite a passage where two different words for Lord are used. One is the divine name, yod He vav He Yahovah. The other is Adon. It's Adoni. Let's see if you're going to catch it. Yes, I did. I have sessions and articles. Look for it. Psalm 110, verse 1, not in the Jehovah Witness Bible. King James Bible, first last, if you don't mind. Let's see if you catch it. A Psalm of David, the Lord said unto my Lord, A Psalm of David, the Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Who caught it here? Even though you have two occurrences of Lord, they're not translating the same Hebrew word. It's two different Hebrew words rendered as Lord. No, who said it's Adonai? Eugenio? Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man is a man that grins. Where'd you get Adonai? Adonai does not appear in Psalm 110 verse 1. Okay. Did you see how the English translation indicated it's not the same Hebrew word? Did you see one more time, first and last? Let's see. Notice the first occurrence of Lord, all capitals. The second occurrence, only the L is capitalized. That's how you know whether the word is the divine name or something else. The first occurrence, the word Lord is all capitals. The second occurrence, only the L is capitalized. You know why? Because in Hebrew, it's Jehovah said to my Adon. It's not the same word. Jehovah said to my Adon. Neom Yahovah la Adoni. Neom Yahovah la Adoni. 
butchering the Hebrew as well. See again, Captain Ron. Pins and needles, needles and pins. A happy man, a man. Captain Ron, I will go to the mosque and become Muslim if the word is Adonai. I just repeated what the word was. It's not Adonai. Pins and needles. Well, I'm, I'm going to retire, brother. It's not Adonai. It's Adoni. Pins and needles, needles and pins. Adoni. E is the singular suffix, my, Adoni, Lord of me, my Adon, Adoni, not Adonai. Okay, everyone got it now? Yahovah Adoni, not Adonai. Yahovah Adoni, Jehovah said to my Lord. Now, let's see how the New World Translation renders it. New World Translation renders it. First, last, if you can, go to the New World Translation. Here's the link to their online Bible. Goes. Jehovah declared to my Lord, bam, there you go. You got it. Now you see the difference. Jehovah declared to my Lord. There you go. Clear now? Okay. So one of the reasons why the Joe's Witnesses published the American Standard Version is because the American Standard Version is one of the few English translations that renders the divine name the Tetragrammaton, yod he vav he as Jehovah. So that's why they like that translation, to show people, see, we didn't make up the name Jehovah. The word Jehovah appears in standard English translations produced by groups other than the Jehovah's Witnesses. In fact, the word Jehovah even appears in the King James Bible. Look at the King James Bible, Psalm 83, 18. And we're going to get into the meat of the matter. Psalm 83, 18. Psalm 83, 18. That men may know, this is King James, that thou whose name alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. Did you catch it? No. Why do they think they are special for using? Isn't it common knowledge of God's name? No, medic, it's not common knowledge. How many people know? Only people know that God's name is Jehovah are those who have been weaned on the King James Bible. Those who've been raised on the King James Bible know his name is Jehovah. But those who've been raised on translations that do not even have a form of the divine name in English, many of them don't know. Many of them don't know. Okay. Now let's see another occurrence of Jehovah in the King James Bible. Are you ready? You ready for the other occurrence? Exodus chapter 6, verses 2 to 3. See, that's why, Medic, because you're raised on King James. You're familiar, Jehovah. But if you have people who've been raised on the NIV or New American Center Bible, hardly any of them, unless they've run into Jehovah's Witnesses, would know Jehovah or Yahweh or Yahovah, right? Here, Exodus 6, 2 to 3. And God spake unto Moses, said unto him, I am the Lord. Do you notice the word Lord is all capitals? Lord, I am Jehovah. It's all capitals. And then verse 3, And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, El Shaddai in Hebrew, El Shaddai. But by my name, Jehovah, was I not known to them. No, actually, Vine, what you were taught is a myth and a tradition of men. Jehovah is not a medieval Error, an error in the anglicization of the divine name. We have now a Jewish scholar, a Karaite Jew, he's not a rabbinic Jew, he's a Karaite Jew, who's actually published his findings based on medieval Jewish manuscripts, medieval Hebrew manuscripts produced by medieval rabbis 
showing that the rabbis have always known the correct pronunciation of the name. His name is Nehemiah, Nehemiah Gordon. You can watch him online. He's got several shows and he gives you the documentation. That's he's, he's actually convinced me because of the documentation. The Jews always pronounce the divine name not as Yahweh, but as Yahovah, which corresponds to Jehovah. So this myth that Jehovah is actually a mistake, that's a myth, that's a mistake. Look up ne Nehemiah. He, call, he, he calls himself Nehemiah. Nehemiah. Look up Nehemiah Gordon, divine name. He actually shows you the manuscripts produced by medieval rabbis that the rabbis have always known how to pronounce the name, but they didn't share it with outsiders. In other words, the correct anglicized form of the divine name is Jehovah. So the King James got it right. Yes, Charles. And he documents it, and he's written books, and he's got videos, videos that are over an hour with full documentation to confirm his point. So... I don't have time to rehash his arguments. He's done it. There's no need for me to do it, but he's convinced me. Right? He's convinced me. So it's Jehovah for me. So King James, again, passes with flying colors. Now, with that said, let's, uh, let's, let's get back to the issue. We're now going to demonstrate that when Jesus is called the firstborn, it's not because he's the first one born or created. It's because he is the one who's the heir of all creation because the entire creation belongs to him and he is supreme over all creation. He holds supremacy over all creation. He's preeminent over all creation. He transcends all creation because he's the one who created it for his glory. And you need to go back and listen to yesterday's session where I prov provided the biblical support for defining firstborn in one of three ways. Let me rehash real quickly. But you got to go back and listen to the session yesterday. Firstborn can have three meanings. The one born first, who is the heir. And because he's the firstborn, he holds the highest position in the family so that he is <clears throat> supreme over the rest of the family members. So it speaks to either the one born first, the one who is the heir, and the one who holds the supreme position or status of authority. I'm going to either block Marshall or bounce Marshall, which is the same thing, because I just explained that the pronunciation is Yahovah. Okay, did, so if you want the biblical evidence for those definitions, you have to listen to yesterday's session. I gave you several. Reuben, Joseph, and David. Reuben, Joseph, and David. Go back and listen for the details and the biblical passages proving that the word can mean all three, but not in every context. Sometimes firstborn simply refers to a person's status. Sometimes, yeah, send this dog on his merry way, muzzle this filthy dog because he can't shut up. Sorry, guys. I'm not going to pull punches, okay? okay coming back to the issue. Sometimes it can refer to status, sometimes it refers to status, and also to the fact that the person is the heir, the inheritance is his. Okay? In light of what I already established yesterday, I'm going to demonstrate that when Jesus is called firstborn, in the context, it means he is the heir because everything was created for him, and by virtue of being the creator and sustainer of all things, he is transcendent over all creation. He's preeminent over all creation. He holds supremacy over all creation because he's the one who created all things and sustains all things. But it doesn't mean the one created first or born first. Right? I don't know what Big Sam means. If you're insulting me, you're going to go too, Jeffrey. But I love you, Jeffrey, but not too much. And your name sounds too close to Jeffrey Dahmer. Okay. Yeah, hit the like button. Now, are you ready for the evidence? 
Colossians 1, we're going to use neural translation. And then I'm going to give you a link to interlinear, interlinear to prove to you that they shamelessly butchered the, the, the Greek. I'm going to give you the link for their own Greek interlinear so you can read with your own eyes how they added a word in their English translation to butcher what the text is actually saying. But first, let's look at their butchering. Colossians 1, 15 and 17. Let's see if the context will tell us why Jesus, our Lord, is said to be the firstborn of all creation. Are you ready? Here's the tra translation of witnesses. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Now, let's look. Then it tells you why. Because by means of him, all other things were created. Pay attention to the word other. In the heavens and on the earth. The things visible and the things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. Also, he is before all other things, and by means of him, all other things were made to exist. Now, he gave me verse 18, which I'll forgive him. I said, Colossians 1, 15 to 17. But let's pay attention to the reason why Jesus Christ is firstborn. Why? It says, because... All things came into existence by his agency. The Father used Jesus to bring all things into being. But now notice the last part of verse 16. Not only did the Father use all things to bring, uh, use Jesus, our Lord, as the Holy Spirit grants me unction and clarity of thought. Not only did the Father use the Lord Jesus to bring all things into existence. Notice the last part of 16. All things were brought into existence for Jesus. So number one, the reason why Jesus is called firstborn is because everything exists for him, belongs to him. In other words, he's the heir. That's the first reason. The second reason why he's the firstborn is right there, because he is the one who brought all things into being, and because he brought all things into being, and because he gives life to all things, because notice what 17 says, he is before all things, and in him all things are kept together. He keeps all things going. He sustains all things. He gives life to all things. And because he's the creator and life giver, the one who created all things and sustains all things and gives life to all things, he is superior to all things that he creates and sustains. You get it? So in context, Jesus is firstborn because he's the heir who created all things to be his own possession. And because he created all things, he happens to be supreme over everything that came into being through him. Is that making sense? Is it making sense before I move on? The passage is so clear that Jesus Christ is firstborn not because he's the first one created, that the Jehovah Witness did something to mislead their members and deceiving them from what this passage is actually saying. They inserted the word other four times. Let's look at 16 and 17 one more time. And then I'm going to give you the link to the interlinear. And you're going to read with your own eyes their Greek interlinear where it doesn't say all other things. It actually says all things were created by, through, and for Jesus. All things were created by, through, and for Jesus. Okay. Pay attention and count with me how many times the word other was inserted. Because by means of him, all other things were created in the heavens and on the earth. The all things, the things visible and things invisible, whether they are thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, all other things have been created through him and for him. Also is before all other things. And by means of him, all other things were made to exist. Four times they inserted the word other. Now, here's their Greek interlinear. 
Greek interlinear, folks. Vine, everyone else. Here you go. Click on it, please. Click on it. Here it is. They're Greek interlinear. Guys, don't take my word for it. Go there. Their own Greek. I'm going to now read the translation of their own Greek, starting at 15. Now, I can read the Greek for you. Has estin, icon to theu, to oratu. But again, I'd be butchering it. Let's just stick with the English. Start at 15 and read with me. Read along with me their own interlinear. Tell me if you see the word other. Okay, you ready? Let's read together. Who is image of God the invisible, firstborn of all creation, Pro, uh, prototokos, pases, tisios, because hati, in him it was created the all. Where's the word other? In him it was created the all. In the heavens and upon the earth, the things visible, the things invisible, whether thrones or lordships or governments or authorities, the all things, tapanta, the all things in parentheses. Where's the word other? Through him and into him, it has been created. And he is before all, pro panton, before all, panton. Where's the word other? And then it says, kita, panta, and the all things in him, and auto, it has stood together. Where in the world do you see the word other in the Greek? Where in, do you see the word other in the Greek? Now, why would an organization insert the word other four times in a passage if the passage was so clear that it taught that Jesus is a creature? In other words, if the passage was clear that Jesus is the first creation, then why do you need to insert the word other to make it say something it doesn't say if it's clear enough that he's a creature. You with me there? If the passage is clear that Jesus is a creature, why then do I need to word, add the word other? Now, when we omit the word other, let's see if we get a different meaning. First, first, last, can you post the King James? Okay. First and last, let's post the King James. Now watch here. For by him were all things created. Wow. Pay attention. When you take the word other out, clearly Jesus is not a mere creature. Because he eternally exists before all creation, and he created the entire creation. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. He exists before all things were created. He existed before all things came into being. Question. And by him all things consist. Question. If Jesus exists before all things came into being, doesn't that mean he was there before creation <clears throat> came into existence? And if he was there before creation came into existence, doesn't this prove that he's uncreated because he existed eternally? Okay, now a follow-up question. If he existed eternally because he's separate from all creation, was there before all creation, then how can firstborn mean he's the first one created when Paul goes on to show you he was there in eternity, existing eternally because he was there before all creation came into being? So then how can firstborn mean the first one created? So do you see now why they inserted the word other four times? 
so that those who've been brainwashed by them will be deceived into thinking that Paul did not say that Jesus is responsible for creating the entire creation. Okay, I take that as a compliment that I'm burning with Joe's teaching. Thank you. So I think that's a blessing. I thought you were about to curse me like the rich man. Okay, is that clear now? Now, if you want to know what preeminence means, Paul tells you in verse 18. We're going to look at the Jehovah Witness translation in verse 18 and the King James Version. Folks, let me tell you something. If there's one version you stick with, stick with the King James. Now, if you have our time with King James, Shakespeare in English, I understand. But this King James Bible won't mislead you, right? It will never misguide you. I don't know what butcher of the word means. I think, oh, that's this rabid dog of Muhammad. He makes Muhammad look clean. Colossians 1.18, Jehovah Witness, and then King James. Guys, read with me. Vine, everyone else, read with me. And he is the head of the body, the congregation. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might become the one who is first in all things. So he might become the one who is first in all things. So even here in their translation, it tells you that Jesus is first in everything. He's preeminent in everything. He's supreme in everything. But let me give you a better translation. King James, better. Colossians 1.18. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. There is your definition of firstborn. The heir who is preeminent, who's supreme, who's sovereign, who is superior to all creation. Don't ask me about Bible versions now, folks. Please. You with me there? You see why he's firstborn? Verse 18 tells you. Verse 18 tells you. Because in everything, Jesus is preeminent. In everything, Jesus is superior. In everything, Jesus holds supremacy because he transcends and he's above, above everything that has come into existence. Clear? Because I want to unpack what it means that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Okay, let's look at Colossians 1.18. Let me unpack this. What does it mean that our Lord is firstborn from the dead? Okay, pay attention as the Holy Spirit grants me unction and clarity of thought and saves me from error. That part where it says firstborn from the dead, it's firstborn out of the dead. What does that mean? It means that Jesus came out of the dead, came forth from the dead in order to destroy death, <clears throat> in order to vanquish death, in order to conquer death so that he could be preeminent over death. So firstborn doesn't mean the first one, first one who's been raised immortal from the dead. That's not the emphasis on the expression firstborn from the dead. Firstborn from the dead means he came out from death, he came forth from death in order to conquer death, vanquish death, destroy death by his resurrection so that he could be preeminent over death. Are you with me there? The reason why Paul is saying firstborn from the dead is because Paul is emphasizing by virtue of his resurrection from the dead, Jesus has now conquered death, vanquished death, and is supreme over death. So we know that's what he means. Because of how he concludes the verse. So that in everything Jesus may be preeminent. So Paul, why is Jesus the firstborn from the dead? Not because he's the first one raised immortal. That's not his emphasis. His emphasis is that he came out of death. Came forth from death to conquer and destroy death by his resurrection. So he can be firstborn over it. Meaning supreme over it. Preeminent over it. Clear? John 
uses the expression in a similar fashion. So if they tell you, well, how do you know firstborn from the dead means that? Because of how the verse concludes. Let's look at verse 18 one more time. And then John in Revelation makes the same point using a similar expression. Notice how he concludes the statement. The firstborn from the dead so that he might become the one who is first in all things. Literally preeminent. He's the firstborn from the dead, the first one to rise immortal in order to conquer death so that by his conquering death, he's now preeminent over death. The emphasis is not on the chronology, but on the supremacy of Christ over death. Clear? Clear? So I want to make sure it sinks in because I'm going to now give you something similar from John and Revelation. Now let's go to Revelation 1.5. John says something similar about the Lord Jesus, that he's the firstborn of the dead. Not out of, de out of death, but of the dead. Revelation 1.5. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead. Now, the preposition is different. Let me show you. In verse 18, Colossians 1.18, it says, Prototokos ek ton nekron. Ek out of from the dead. That's Colossians 1.18. Revelation 1, 1.5, the preposition. In fact, there is no preposition, for, if I recall correctly. Let me show you. The preposition is ek in Colossians 1.18. Now, here's Revelation 1.5. Okay. Yep. Here it's ha prototokos ton nekron. There is no preposition. Ha prototokos ton nekron. Okay. Now, similar expression conveying the same point. What did John mean when he said the Lord Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead or from the dead? Well, you know, I to guess because his point is that he's preeminent supreme over death because in the next line he mentions he's the ruler of the kings of the earth meaning he is sovereign over death and he's sovereign over the kings of the earth he's sovereign over every authority and sovereign over death so john's point is to emphasize christ's supremacy over death itself as well as over every ruler and to further prove that's what john means when he says jesus is the firstborn from the dead that this is what he means? Revelation 1, 17, 18. Revelation 1, 17, 18. When I saw him, I fell as dead at his feet. And he laid his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one and became dead. So Jesus is speaking. Jesus says, I'm the first last, the living one who became dead. But look, I'm living forever and ever, and I have the keys of death and of the grave. You see, death and the grave are in my hands, in my control. I have supreme power over death and the grave, meaning I'm the one who determines when and how and where you will die. I have supreme power over death and the grave. So do you see why Jesus is called firstborn of the dead? Do you see why? Is it making sense, everyone here? Clear? Before I move on? So I want to make sure. If someone's confused, let me know. Okay. Just to prove to you that Jesus has power over life and death. He determines when you die, where you die, why you die, right? You know, that it's in his control. Let's go to Revelation 2.18. Revelation 2.18. Vi and everyone else, pay attention to this. Revelation 2.18. All right, hey, where are you, sister? God bless you. Revelation 2.18. To the angel of the congregation in Thyatira write, these are the things that the Son of God says. Guys, you need to pay attention that it's Jesus speaking. 
These are the things that the Son of God says. The Son of God is speaking. The one who has eyes like a fiery flame and whose feet are like fine copper. The Son of God is speaking. The Son of God is speaking. So there is no argument that it's Jesus, the Son of God, who's speaking these words. Let's pick it up at verse 21 to 23. Pay attention. Revelation 2, 21 to 23. And I gave her time to repent. He's talking about the false prophetess Jezebel who seduces servants into idolatry and sexual morality. He says, I gave this false prophetess time to repent, but she's not willing to repent of her sexual immorality. Look, I'm about to throw her into a sick bed and those committing adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. Notice two things before you get to 23. And don't comment, but pay attention. Notice Jesus' patience. He doesn't rush to destroy, condemn, or judge because his desire is for all to come to repentance, even a false prophetess. So he gave this false prophetess enough warning, enough time to repent. She didn't. So number one, Jesus doesn't rush to judgment. Jesus' heart is that everyone comes to repentance. That's number one. Number two, knowing that she won't repent, Jesus now throws her in a sickbed. He strikes her ill in order to kill her dead. Now, you see the wisdom of Christ in not striking her dead right away. After all, Jesus, don't you know everything? You know she won't repent. So why did you wait? So that people won't accuse me of being quick to judge and being harsh. I gave her enough time to repent, knowing she wouldn't repent, so that others would see that I'm completely just in now destroying her. You see what, what he's doing here? So don't you dare tell me I'm a harsh God, a cruel God, an unmerciful God, a merciless God. I gave her enough time and warning to repent. She didn't. Now, doesn't she deserve the judgment that I'm bringing on her? Do you see the wisdom, the beauty of God? You understand why Jesus is doing it? Jesus would have been justified in killing her dead at the moment. Why? Because he knows she won't repent. So then why did you tolerate more evil and immorality? To silence you, my critics. So you don't say, Jesus, you are merciless and harsh and cruel. You see the wisdom, the majesty, the beauty of the Lord Jesus? And why he does what he does, even though we may not fully understand? Making sense? Thank you, Daily Gripe. I like him. The brother after my own heart. That's a con with a require another three sessions. <laughs> you know me too well. God bless you, brother. You know, you can wear your Indian headdress right now. But anyway, you everyone got it? Vine, everyone else, you see the wisdom, the beauty, the brilliance. The patience, the mercy, the love of Christ. But here's the key. Revelation 2, 23. And by the way, this shows you that Jesus has power even over diseases. He can allow you to be struck with a disease or protect you from a disease. Because he says, I threw her in a sickbed. And I'm bringing tribulation on those who follow her, her spiritual children. But now notice 23. Who has the power over death? Notice Jesus, the Son of God, speaking in 23. And I will kill her children with deadly plague. I will kill them dead with disease because I have the power over life and death so that all the congregations will know that I am the one who searches the innermost thoughts and hearts, and I will give to you individually according to your deeds. Whoa. Revelation 2.18 says this is the Son of God speaking. The Son of God in 23 says, I have the power to kill people dead with disease because I have the power over life and death. And then the Son of God says, when I do this, then all the churches will know who I am. The one who searches the innermost thoughts and hearts, and I will give to, e to you individually according to your deeds. Folks, can I ask you a question? What attributes must Jesus, the Son of God, possess 
to be sovereign over life and death and to know the thought of every creature in order to be able to perfectly repay every creature for what he or she has thought and done. And this is the New World Translation, by the way. This is the New World Translation we read. Let me repeat it again. What kind of attributes must Jesus, the Son of God, possess to claim what he just did? Have power over life and death and know the thoughts, the innermost thoughts of every creature in order to be able to perfectly repay everyone for what they have done. Come on. Own omniscience. Let me repeat again. Power over life and death. That no force in creation can stop him from killing someone dead or preventing someone from dying. Okay, now let's compare Revelation 2.23 back to back with Jeremiah 17 verse 10. Revelation 2.23 back to back with Jeremiah 17 verse 10. Let's see if you catch it. Come on, guys. Let's see if you catch it. Revelation 2.23, Jehovah Witness Bible. I'm only using Joe's Witness Bible. Revelation 2.23 and Jeremiah 17, verse 10, back to back. And I, it's the Son of God speaking. Verse 18 shows it's the Son of God. Son of God says, I will kill her children with deadly plague so that all the congregations will know that I, the Son of God, am the one who searches the innermost thoughts and hearts, and I will give to you individually according to your deeds. But now notice Jeremiah 17.10. I, Jehovah, am searching the heart, examining the innermost thoughts to give to each one according to his ways, according to the fruitage of his works. Wait, 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 wait. Jesus, why do you sound like Jehovah God of Jeremiah 17.10? Your words, Jesus, are identical to what Jehovah says about himself in Jeremiah 17, verse 10. And this is the Jehovah's Witness Bible, Jesus. This is the New World Translation of Jehovah's Witnesses. Why is it in their Bible you sound like you're Jehovah God? Medic, because let me be honest with you, brother. Don't be offended. You suck as an apologist and evangelist. If you let them get away with that, you really suck. You should start, stay, stay being a doctor. You know why you suck? What does receiving authority from the Father have to do with Jesus having to be omniscient and omnipotent? So you're saying that God can make a creature omniscient, omnipotent? Medic, can you give up evangelism and be a doctor? Because you suck as an apologist, buddy. This is the second time you raise this objection, and it's killing me. You don't know how to refute it. What does a, being given authority have to do with his ability to know everything and everyone? Unless you believe that God can make a creature omniscient and omnipotent. No more for me. I have to stop. I need to find another line of work. I can't do this. Did it sink in? Yeah. Did you get it now, medic? I wish you were close to me so I can lay hand right on your mouth and bless you. Heal! Man, I, you be blessed. You be blessed. Pins and needles, needles and pins. Okay. Thank you, Jeffrey. And you suck lemons. That's what I meant. You suck lemons. You know, you suck limes, right? So just want you to know that. Hey! All right. For everyone else who knows how to, you know, do apologetics and evangelize, it's up this little sap sucker neophyte, Dr. Wannabe. But anyway, for everyone else, do you see why that argument worked? Oh, the father gave him authority. What does authority have to do with ability? So you're saying the father made him omnipotent, omniscient, so the father can make a creature <clears throat> omniscient, omnipotent, and yet a creature by definition is limited? How can a creature then become unlimited in power and knowledge and wisdom? Maria Ramos, we don't say OMG. We don't take the Lord's name in vain unless you meant, oh my goodness. Heal! You thought, man. All right. 
I'm from East LA, Esse. Don't be a paragraph, okay? You my Esse. Born in East LA, I was born in East LA. I was. All right, everyone got it now? Okay, everyone else got it? All, right. All my exes are from Texas. <laughs> everyone got it now? Vine and everyone else. Did you get it? That Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 2, 18 and 23 claims to have power over life and death and knows every heart and every thought of every individual, which is why he can perfectly repay everyone according to their deeds. And he even picks up the language of Job in Jeremiah 17, 10 and applies it to himself. Everyone got it? Is someone confused? Let me know. Medic, did you get it? I want to make sure. All right. So then... What does it mean when Paul and John say Jesus Christ is the firstborn of the dead from the dead? Are they focusing on the fact that he's the first one to be raised immortal? No. Their focus is in being raised immortal, in coming out of death and becoming immortal, Jesus destroyed death, vanquished death, conquered death and became supreme over death by his resurrection to immortality. So firstborn from the dead, of the dead, means he is supreme, preeminent over death because he conquered it by his resurrection. And to confirm it, in Revelation 118 and 2, 18 and 23, Jesus says he holds the keys to death and the grave, and he's the one who can strike people dead. Kill them dead with plagues, right? Because he has the power of life and death. And yet, as far as the Hebrew Bible is concerned, God and only God, Jehovah and only Jehovah, has power over life and death. And Jehovah alone searches the hearts and tests the thoughts of the kidneys to repay everyone according to their deeds. All of which Jesus just described to himself in Revelation 1, 17 to 18, and Revelation 2, 18 to 23. Everyone got it? So did we establish from Colossians 1, 15 to 18, that Jesus is the firstborn of all creation, not because he's the first one created. It's because he is the one that brought the entire creation into existence. He is the one who created all creation, sustains all creation, preserves all creation, and made all creation for himself in union with the Father and the Spirit. Therefore, as the creator of all things, sustainer of all things, for whom all creation exists, he is firstborn in that he's supreme, preeminent, transcendent above all creation. That's why he's the firstborn. He's firstborn in terms of preeminence and in terms of, of being the heir. It's his inheritance. Right? That's what Paul means in Colossians 1 and in Hebrews 1. This is why the society had to insert the word other four times in Colossians 1, 16, 17, which is not in the Greek because they knew if they translate it as it appears in the Greek, by means of him, all things are created in heaven and on earth, nothing excluded. Then this conclusively, irrefutably, explicitly establishes Jesus existed before all creation, is separate from all creation. Therefore, he's eternal by nature, uncreated by nature, because he was there before all creation came to be. See how clear it is? But let me add more of a nightmare to the Jehovah Witness position. Okay. Hebrews 1, Hebrews 1, verse 8, and we're going to skip 10 to, uh, well, Hebrews 1, verse 8 and 10. 
We're going to skip nine. Hebrews 1, verse 8 and 10. Exactly. It's in the creeds. Because I'm going to show you another argument. This one you have to hear. You have to hear this. But about the son, he says, here, the father speaking to the son about the son. Guys, please pay attention. If you get these arguments, I promise you, if you learn these arguments, no one can refute you <clears throat> on the basis of the sound, honest exegesis of scriptures. Yeah, they're going to object. They'll throw out arguments, red herrings, but they cannot give you an honest refutation based on a sound, accurate interpretation of the Bible. Impossible because you have the truth. You with me there? Hebrews 1, 8 and 10, the father speaks to the son and about the son. Notice what he says to the son and about the son. Pay attention here. Okay. But about the son, he says, God is your throne forever and ever. And the scepter of your kingdom is the scepter of uprightness. And then the father goes on to say to the son, and at the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth and the heavens are the work of your hands. Jehovah Witness won't disagree with you. If you show him these passages, the Jehovah Witness will admit the Father created the heavens through the Son. Ask them, do you believe Jehovah created the heavens through the Son? They'll say yes. Pay attention. Jehovah created the heavens and the earth through the Son. They'll say yes. So the Son was there before the heavens were made. Yes. The Son existed before the creation of the heavens. Okay. Here's what you need to ask them. Is it not true that the Bible says God created the dwelling places of creatures before he created <clears throat> those who dwell in them. In other words, he created earth before he created man and animals to live on the earth. He created heaven before he created the angels to live in heaven. They'll say yes. Heaven was created and then the angelic creatures were created to dwell in heaven because they needed a dwelling place, a place to dwell in. Okay, pay attention. But according to you, Jesus is the archangel Michael, right? Yeah. So if he's a spirit creature, an angel, and angels were created to dwell in heaven, so heaven, their dwelling place, was made before the angels came into being. Where was Jesus existing? Where did Jesus dwell in when you just admit that Jesus was there before the heavens were made? Where was he dwelling? Where did he exist? Where did Jesus dwell if he's the archangel Michael and you admit he was there before the heavens were created because Jehovah created the heavens through the agency of Jesus? Because before the heavens and the earth, there is no dwelling place. There's before the heavens and the earth, there is no dwelling place. There is no space. There is no place. There is no time. The only thing you have is God. And God by nature is bodiless, spaceless, timeless, placeless. Where did this creature dwell before there was <clears throat> space, place, time, matter, especially heaven? That's what one elder told me, Tony. One Jehovah Witness elder told me, we don't know. God didn't tell us a mystery. Do you know that, Tony? Uh, no, but an elder did tell me that. A Jehovah Witness elder who had been a Jehovah Witness for 10 years told me, we don't know the answer to that. That's something we don't know. Right? Eugenio, you're not paying attention. How can God have a throne before creation comes into being when a throne is a material object, an object made of substance of some kind? The only answer is that Jesus existed within God, with God, inseparably from him. But nothing in God, nothing with God is created. Therefore, you end up with Jesus having to be eternal and created by nature. You with me there? Did it sink in? 
the only quote unquote place Jesus could have existed is within God, inseparably from God, which means he can't be a creature because nothing in God that's inseparable from God can be created. You get it now? Is it sinking in? I don't know if it's sinking in for you guys. If you understand what firstborn doesn't mean and does mean, understand this argument, I promise you, no anti-Trinitarian agent of Satan can refute you on the basis of solid exegesis that's accurate and honest to the text. He or she can only make excuses and butcher the text. That's how irrefutable... The biblical evidence for the revelation of the Trinity is. Did it sink in? And I have an article on this. The irrationality of Arianism. Let me get you the article. Okay. Save it. Read it. Distribute it. Here you go. Vine everyone else. Is it sinking in? Medic. Is it sinking in? Let me get you the article. Not done yet, because I want to really cover all bases by the grace of God to have this now archived on my YouTube channel so that I don't have to repeat the same question. Now you got all the meat. Here you go. Here's the article. This is the article I wrote. It's Jesus as the first creature, the impossibility of, and irrationality of the Aryan position. And in this article, I quote the Jehovah's Witnesses admitting God, Jehovah God, created the heavens through Jesus so that Jesus was there before the heavens. Here it is. Here's the link again. How many of you got the point? Did it sink in? Did you get the point? Vine, which part you didn't hear? Which part you didn't hear? Man, I hope. What part did I lose you, Vine? Just want to make sure because I'll catch you, you know, bring you up to speed. I just want to see if he's here. I don't know. Well, what was the last thing you heard? Because last five minutes doesn't tell me. What's the last thing you heard, brother? Zina, you've been listening to all this too? Okay, before I move on. Hold on. Let me just see. I just want to help. I want to catch. I want to help Vine to catch up because I want him to get this point. What was the last thing? Okay. All right. Okay, Vine, let me repeat real quickly. Hebrews 1, 8 and 10 state that the father said to the son, Vine, catch up with me and you can go listen to the archive. The father said to the son, at the beginning, O Lord, Vine, pay attention to this argument. At the beginning, O Lord, meaning Jesus, the Father says to the Son, you are the Lord at the beginning that laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. So now, Vine, follow this. The Father says to the Son, the heavens are the work of your hands. Joe's witnesses admit, and here's my article, Vine. Save this article, because I quote them. They admit, Jehovah God the Father created the heavens through the Son, so that the Son existed before the heavens now vine here's the problem the bible is clear that god creates the dwelling places of creatures before he creates creatures to dwell in them in other words the earth was created before humans and animals were created to live on the earth likewise heaven was created before the angels were created to live in heaven and they admit heaven had to have been created before angels could be created because angels needed a place to live in, Vine. But now here's the problem, Vine. Jesus to them is the archangel Michael. So he's an angel. But they're admitting to you, Vine, that the Father created the heavens through the Son, the archangel Michael, so that the archangel Michael was there before heaven was made. But if he's an angelic creature, how can he exist before his dwelling place? Where was he dwelling when there was no dwelling place for him to live in? And here's my article on this vine. The title is, Jesus as the first creature, the impossibility and irrationality of the Aryan position. 
So fine. Jesus existed before time, space, and place. He's an angelic creature that existed before his dwelling place was made. Where did he exist? The only thing you have before the creation of heavens and earth, which is before the creation of time, space, and place, is God. Because God by nature is spaceless, placeless, bodiless. So where did this creature dwell? The only answer is this creature, in some sense, existed in God, even though God is not a spatial being and is inseparable from God. But if he existed in God as, and is inseparable from God, he can't be a creature because there's nothing that's in God or a part of God that's created. Boy, do they have a nightmare. Here's the article again. And I'm sure you guys benefited by me repeating it for the sake of Vine because we're creatures of repetition. We hear things over and over again until it becomes second nature. Let me repeat because I'm going to end it with John 1. Let me repeat this point again. This is the honest truth before the triune God. If you learn these arguments, understand these arguments, and know how to articulate them, I assure you, no anti-Trinitarian agent of Satan can honestly refute your arguments on the basis of a sound, accurate, honest interpretation of Scripture because the evidence for the Trinity is irrefutable, overwhelming. They can't do it. That's why they have to butcher passages and do a lot of tap dancing and explaining away. As Andrew Martin said, once you realize that time and space are non Fundamental properties of this universe, which Joe's witnesses admit was created. This makes it clearer. And yet they're telling you Jesus existed before the universe, before the heaven where angels dwell was made. You got it now? Now let's go to John 1 and we're going to read verse 3 from the Jehovah Witness translation. I'm going to tell you how they're going to refute you and how you're going to refute them. John 1, verse 3. All things came into existence through him. Now, this is the Jehovah Witness Bible. All things came into existence through him. The word, the logos, hologos, agenita, came through him. Pay attention. Apart from him, apart from Jesus, apart from his agency, not even one thing came into existence. And then it says, what has come into existence in verse 4 was by means of him was life. Okay. Let's look at verse 4 to complete the thought. This is their translation. By means of him was life, and the life was the light of men. So notice their translation says, everything that came into existence, all things that have been created, were created by means of the Logos, Jesus, who then became flesh. And what came into being through him was the life of all creation. Now, how do they get around this? You know what they'll tell you? Here's where they tell you. Ah, you, you don't get it, Riaz. When it says all things came into existence through Jesus, the word, it's not talking about the creation of everything. It's talking about the creation of the physical universe because they'll tell you that John 1 is echoing Genesis 1.1. And Genesis 1.1 is talking about the creation of the physical universe. It's not talking about all creation. Because they think that in Genesis 1-1, God is not addressing the creation of the spiritual dimension called heaven where angels dwell. Let me repeat their argument. You ready? I want to repeat their argument again. They're going to tell you, they're going to tell you that John 1-1 is echoing Genesis 1-1. Because it starts off the same way. Genesis 1-1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John 1-1, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God, and the word was a God, according to their perversion. Okay. The Joe Witness is going to tell you John 1.1 1, 1 is echoing Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. It's talking about that creation. And in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, it's not talking about all the heavens. It's only talking about the physical universe. It says nothing about the spiritual dimension called heaven. That's not being addressed. And it is true. The entire universe, the physical universe, was made by Jesus. But the heaven of the angels existed before the physical universe was made. So John 1, 3 is not talking about the creation of everything. You see how they get around it? 
You understand what their objection is, right? If you got the objection, I can show you how to refute them from their own Bible. Are you now ready for the refutation? Are you ready for the refutation? Who told you that Genesis 1-1 is only talking about the creation of the physical universe, the sky and space and the earth? Who told you that? Where would you get that from? I will prove to you from their own translation, Genesis 1 is talking about the creation of everything, all the heavens, not just the sky, not just space, but the spiritual dimension where angels dwell, the creation of the entire <clears throat> created order, all the heavens and the earth and everything in them. Are you all ready for the proof? Are you ready for me to prove it from their translation? Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. Now, we may have to look at, I forget, I got to see. Genesis chapter 2, verse 4. This is the history of the heavens and the earth and the time they were created. And the day that Jehovah made the earth and heaven, right? We're missing something. Something is missing. I'm going to have to hurt this guy because he's not giving me everything. Okay, let me go there. Hold on. Hold on. It's what I get for hiring people and paying them nothing. Hold on. I'm going to go to the link myself. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay, you know what? It's because probably... Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. I'm trying to see. Okay. Let's, yeah, see, this is it. Okay. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. You see, I pay him good, and I pay him nothing, and I condemn him for my mistake. But here's what you're going to have to do, though. You're going to have to look at the inter, uh, their online translation. Genesis chapter 2, verse 1. Sorry about that. Say, I pay him good. I pay him nothing. Okay. Genesis 2, 1. The heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. Now, here's what I need you guys to do. I want you to click there. Click there, Genesis 2.1. Make sure you show them their note. Go there, Genesis 2.1. You see the asterisk after them? Thus the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. Click on their note, and it says all their army. Do you see it? Je Jeffrey, you can donate by my Patreon pages or PayPal. I'll give you my email to the PayPal in a minute. Does everyone see it says all their army? The word army in, Hebr in Hebrew is uh, sabot, 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 all their host, all their host. Now, let me give you their other versions. This is the 2013 updated version. Let me give you the one they used before this, okay? The 1984 edition. It's all online. I'm going to give you the link. 1984 edition. Okay, here you go. This one here. 1984 edition. Now, they're not going to deny it if you show them from their translation. Here's the link to their 1984 edition. Here's the link. Thank you, Jesus Reigns. And their 1984 edition reads, Thus the heavens and the earth and all their army came to their completion. All their army. Uh, Saboeth, Sabot. I'm butchering the Hebrew like I butcher the Greek, like I butcher English. You know why that's important? As any Joe witness will admit if he or she is trained, the phrase all their army or all their host is a reference to everything that exists in heaven and on earth. And oftentimes the phrase army or host is used in reference to angels. So if you ask a Bible writer, when you say that God created heavens and all their hosts, what do you mean? They'll say, oh, everything that dwells in the heavens, stars, sun and moon, and the angels. That's the host of the heavens. What do you mean the host of the earth? Everything on earth, plants, trees, animals, humans, vegetation, birds, you name it, insects. So here in Genesis 2.1, it tells you, that Genesis is recounting the creation of all the heavens and the earth and all their hosts, all their armies, the armies of the heavens and the armies of the earth. 
all creatures that exist in the entire creation. It's inclusive of all creation. Genesis 2 verse 1. Are you catching it? What they translate as all their army, go look at the Hebrew. It's uh, Saboeth or Saboeth, right? Everyone pronounce it. And there, that phrase means the hosts of the heavens and the hosts of the earth, depending on the context. If you say the hosts of heaven, you mean everything that dwells in the heavens, the stars, the sun and moon, and the angels. Let me prove that to you from their version. Okay, are you ready for the proof? Psalm 148, verses 1 to 2. Psalm 148, verses 1 to 2. Using the Jehovah Witness Bible. Watch here. And then we're going to compare it with the King James. Praise Jah. Praise Jehovah from the heavens, plural. Shemaim. Praise him in the heights. Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his army. Do you see the proof that army of heavens refers to angels? Do you see right there, front of your eyes, their own translation? Praise him, all his angels. Praise him, all his army. Notice it's talking about the heavens and the army of the heavens, which are the angels. I'm almost done, Vine, so you can hear the rest of it tomorrow. God bless you. Psalm 103, 20 to 21. Orthodox, let's focus, friend. I know you want to get married, but not here. Psalm 103, 20 to 21. Yep, I'm going to go to Nehemiah 9, 6 next. Praise Jehovah, all you, you his angels, mighty in power, who carry out his word, obeying his voice. Praise Jehovah, all his armies, his ministers who do his will. Did you catch it? The angels are the armies, are the ministers of Jehovah. Did you catch it? The angels are, the armies are the ministers of Jehovah. So when Genesis 2-1 says, after God created the heavens and the earth in six days and rested on the seventh day, that's when heaven and earth, the heavens, Shemaim, and earth, and all their armies were created, completed. It's inclusive of every creature that exists everywhere in heaven and on earth. So don't let the Joe witness mislead you into thinking that Genesis 1, Genesis 2 is not about the creation of all created things. It's only referring to the creation of the physical universe. That's not what Genesis chapter 1 in context is referring. When you look at Genesis 2, 1, there clearly you're told that what the author has in mind is the creation of all the heavens, not just sky and space and the host of the sky and space, but even this dimension called heaven where angels dwell. It's the creation of the entire created order, spiritual and physical, whether angelic beings or physical entities. And this is further confirmed in Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. Okay, now read with me. Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 6. You alone are Joe. And by the way, Nehemiah is recounting the Genesis account of creation. That's what he has in mind as he's praying Jehovah because he's saturated in the Old Testament. You alone are Jehovah. You made the heavens, plural, yes, the heaven of the heavens and all their army, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. And you preserve all of them alive, and the army of the heavens are bowing down to you. He's echoing Genesis chapter 1 and 2. He's meditating on the creation account, and there he sees that clearly Genesis chapter 1, if you read in context all the way to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, the heavens and the earth refer to all the heavens, space, sky, the spiritual dimension where angels dwell, all the angelic hosts in that heaven, stars, sun, and moon. In the space, the birds of the sky, the earth, and everything in it. In other words, Genesis chapter 1, all the way to Genesis chapter 2, verse 3, is speaking of the creation of the entire created order, spiritual, physical, visible, and invisible, so that when John 1, verses 1 to 3, starts off by saying, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, all things came into being through Him. John 1 is echoing interpreting Genesis chapter 1, 
But John 1 knows that in Genesis 1, it's talking about the entire creation, the creation of every created thing in all the heavens, including angels and on the earth, so that when then he says that the word was used by God the Father to bring everything that is coming to being into existence, he clearly means that Jesus is the creator of the entire creation. He exists before the entire creation. Therefore, he's not a mere creature because if he was there before the entire creation, he's uncreated, eternal by nature, the one who brought all creation into being. Therefore, he's older than all creation. Well, to exist before creation means you're eternal. You're not a creature. He's the eternal word of the Father, inseparable from him. Bye-bye, Jehovah Witness. Clear? But now, Riaz and everyone else, you have to see how they explain John 1, 3. And you have to be able to show them from the scriptures their interpretation that Genesis 1 is not talking about the creation of all the heavens. Even the spiritual dimension where angels live is wrong. They're distorting Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Genesis 1 and 2 is speaking of the creation of every created thing, the entire created order, all of the heavens, spiritual and physical, and all their hosts, angels as well. You, you with me there? Do not let them deceive you into thinking it's only talking about the Genesis account of creation, and Genesis account of creation is only about the physical universe. That's not what Genesis 1 and 2 happen to be referring to. Genesis 1 and 2 refer to all of creation, spiritual and physical, angels, spiritual creatures, and physical objects. And yet there is the Logos, Hologos, Jesus the Word that was there with God the Father before the entire creation even existed, which means Jesus the Word was there in eternity, eternally existing with the Father, one with the Father in essence, and then he is the one the Father appointed to then bring the entire creation of every created thing, spiritual, physical, visible, invisible, into being. Therefore, there is no escaping, even from their perversion, Jesus the Word is eternal by nature, uncreated by nature, and he's God Almighty, distinct from the Father, one with him in essence, who then became flesh. Game over, Jehovah Witness. In fact, let's see how the King James Version renders Genesis 2, verse 1. Genesis 2, verse 1 in the King James Version. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. Do you see why I love the King James Bible and cherish it and honor it? You see how it translated the Hebrew beautifully? Thus the heavens, Shemaim, and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. Beautiful. You caught it? Amen. You caught it there? Folks, let me end with something serious because I trust for my family. I know people are going to listen to this and use this to bash me. Use this to discredit me. Yesterday, the Lord Jesus blessed me with good news. He blessed me because I was granted permission. I can stay where I'm at permanently for the foreseeable future. So glory to God, he gave me favor with the locals. Pray that they continue to work with me and favor me, that I can stay here. But now here's where I got some bad news. Okay, I'm going to be very upfront with you guys because, guys, I truly need the Lord to show up. I truly need the Lord to do a miracle because I'm tired. I really am. Okay. And I have to be careful what I say because I don't want to sound like I'm bashing. So first of all, pray that God will heal my heart supernaturally, miraculously, to have the heart of Jesus and truly forgive and hold no grudges. Because I can say for the most part, I don't have anger and hate, but there are those times in which I think and then anger and hate arises and I have to rebuke it in the name of Jesus, asking the spirit to cleanse my heart. Okay, because this legal system is so corrupt and because I'm in full-time ministry and because you have a corrupt judge that doesn't understand how ministry works, glory to God, because I have a set number of supporters, there's a set salary I get monthly where I'm not rich and I'm not complaining, but it helps me 
to stand my feet, right, for my daily provisions and also take care of my daughters, even though I need to increase it in time. But you guys who are in ministry understand how it works. Sometimes you're going to have people in a time of need giving you above and beyond what you make as a gift, one-time sacrifice to help you. I mean, remember David Wood when he needed support? I forgot what it was. And he needed 8,000. And glory to God, the people of God showed such love that he got 80,000. And let me tell you something about David Wood. He is one of the most generous and open-handed people you'll meet. When he got more than he needed, he used that money to help other people in ministry, to bless other people in ministry, and to support them. I'm one of them. Okay? When Bill Koreshi was dying of cancer and put a GoFundMe page, he got nearly a million dollars. Okay? People of the world who are of the devil don't understand how it works. They think if this is the kind of money you're bringing in, then you must be making tons of money and hiding it. That's how they think because they don't know how it works. Well, a corrupt legal team convinced this corrupt, wicked, and I'm sorry, I know this is going to be used against me, but I'm trusting Jesus, filthy, wicked judge. And so you can see how wicked and filthy she is. Here, there are sites begging her removal because she destroys men. Here it is. Don't take my word for it. This is who I'm up against. Only God can say she is wicked. If you see how she treats me, she is wicked. And she see how she treats me and how she talks down to me because she thinks I'm a liar. Rewarding my ex-wife's infidelity and destroying my family. All right. Here's where I'm facing a trial. When this court, when this judge passed the decision, when the divorce was final, she not only gave my home to my, my ex-wife, she ordered me to pay. I'm being right up front with you guys. Here's the link. Not only pay $1,500 child support, which I'll gladly give if I make enough. She also ordered me to pay $1,400 alimony to my ex-wife, who makes just as much, if not more than me, for two and a half years for a total of $29,000 that came out of my 40% share of the equity. And my 40% share of the equity was only $24,000, so I didn't see a dime. So I still ended up owing my ex $5,000. On top of that, she ordered me to pay my ex-wife's attorney fees $15,000. I had such a corrupt lawyer, a dishonest, wicked lawyer, that he told me he's going to now appeal to the appellate court. That wicked demon lawyer lied and never went through. God saved me because I had a deadline. He exposed this wicked, evil lawyer, and I was able to file for the, for the appeal just in time. Then I had to find a lawyer to do the appellate proceeding for me. But months had gone by, and I wasn't able to put what is called a bond to stop payment until the appellate court decides. So guess what the lawyers did? They went after me in August saying he hasn't paid the 15,000. And on top of that, told the judge, they want me to pay their fees for responding to my appeal, $25,000. You know what the judge did out of her hatred? This was August. I had 30 days to pay them that $25,000 and then 60 days to pay that $15,000 even though we're waiting for the decision of the appellate court, she didn't care. She goes, you got 60 days. So then I had to then tell my lawyer, file another motion to appeal the $25,000 that she wants me to pay, which he did. But now, November 20th, they're trying to drag me back into court to pay the $40,000 or I suffer the consequences. $40,000, there are people who don't even make that much. November 20th, folks. And here's the problem. I'm no longer in the state. And I can't afford to fly out to that state. That's in Chicago. I am not there. I can't go. So I spoke to my lawyer and I told her, you're going to have to do something because I can't be there. So my fear is that this wicked, filthy agent of the devil may say that I'm in contempt of court and try to get me arrested. Even though it's my ex-wife's attorney fees, I'm not robbing anyone. And even though I'm in another state, do you see my situation? You see where I'm at? Cam, sister, brother, if you brought Johnny Cocker in front of this judge, you would lose. Go to the Facebook page. She is known for destroying men. She destroyed a, a, a friend of mine, someone I know. She's known for destroying men. Angela, Lord willing, 
if the appellate court doesn't go in my favor, I will have to do that bankruptcy. But until I get there, I need God to keep me away from this woman because I don't know what she's going to do because I can't come. I won't show up November 20th. I'm here. So my lawyer has to go and do something. You understand why I need the Lord to show up because I'm tired? I'm tired, folks. I can't fight this. So I'm already preparing myself. God forbid, may it not happen that I might have to go to jail because of an ex-wife who committed adultery twice and destroyed my family, my family and my home, and used corrupt lawyers, filthy, wicked agents of Satan, a corrupt judge to destroy me. And you wonder why men don't want to get married. So folks, if I ever needed a miracle, I really need a miracle November 20th that I stay here, I don't have to go back, and I don't go get thrown in, in jail, and God save me, because there's no way I'm paying that 40000 I didn't accrue it. Choose Jesus. There are plenty of people in jail who convert people in jail. Believe me, the Lord doesn't need me to do it, but if he wants me there, I'll be there. Well, Riaz, I don't want to pay the 40000 It's not my attorney fees. It's her fees. She chose that law firm. She accrued those fees. Why am I paying for her infidelity, adultery? Do you understand why it's easy to hate someone and wish God's wrath and destruction? And on top of that, I have not seen my daughter since June. That's partially why I left the state. I'm here. Folks, you really need to be praying for me. You really need to be asking the Lord a miraculous intervention, November 20th, perhaps maybe even the appellate court. We can get word from the appellate court anytime. It may be favorable or they may reinforce the decision. The appellate court may come out saying, unfair, you don't pay that 15000 Glory to God, that would be relief. Either way, pray God in his mercy keeps me in the state, brings my daughters to me, and no jail time for someone's infidelity, adultery, wicked and filthy adultery. May God have mercy and forgive her and heal my heart because she's still the mother of my children. So, folks, that's where I'm at. And you see why I'm kind of tired. I really am. I don't want to be thinking of this. I want to be focused on Jesus, love with Jesus, living for Jesus, worshiping Jesus, proclaiming Jesus, and trusting that the Lord will bring my daughters to me. It's tiring. It's tiring. It's tiring. Okay. Thank you for allowing me to be very transparent with you because I know brothers and sisters in Christ that won't share these things because they know out in social media, People are waiting to hear this stuff, to discredit us, to attack us, to try to shame us. But I trust the Lord Jesus to vindicate me, and I know that you love the Lord enough that you won't use this to slander me or hurt me. Right? So here's the link again. Don't take my word for it. Here it is. Go click and see how wicked and filthy this judge is. Pray God will do something against her. Because if you saw how she looked at me and how, you know what she did? She got up with her arrogance and she goes, you did it to yourself. You did it to yourself. See? I had a friend, a brother there in Christ. You know how angry he got? You know what he did? He got so angry when the judge said that. He shouted out loud. He goes, he did it or she did it by whoring around because my ex-wife was there. And the judge says, get out of my courtroom. So, folks, thank you again for being my family. Thank you again for allowing me to be transparent. You know I'm risking a lot by sharing this with you. But I trust Jesus, and I love the Lord. And because of him, I know you love him, and for his sake, you won't use this to bash me, but pray me out of this. November 20, I'm tired. I don't want to be thinking, uh oh November 20th. Pray God, do something, and I'm done. Okay? So, Christ has died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah, God Almighty to the Father. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. And please, Lord Jesus, fight for us. Fight for our children. Lord, you know I cannot win this battle. I will lose, and I am losing. All I ask, Lord Jesus, vindicate me. Remove this debt. Keep me away from prison, away from this judge. Plant me here for your glory and bring my daughters. And give me comfort that I need to focus on you, Lord. Because Satan wants to use this to stop me from teaching so I can be distracted. But it will never happen because I'm trusting that your blood will cover us and my daughters and your spirit will seal us. Help us, Lord, to get holier, to be more in love with you. And Lord, help me to get healthier as well. Please, Lord Jesus, please, please, we love you. In Jesus' name. Andrew, my brother, let me share something with you. 
Shame on me if I commit suicide for something so stupid. I know you mean well, you love me and I love you. But don't ever think for a moment that something like this will move me to suicide. Do you know why, Andrew? Because Jesus loves me too much and the Holy Spirit has produced too much love in my heart for Jesus to do something so stupid. There are brothers and sisters in Christ who are being tortured, beaten, imprisoned, violated, and even murdered, and they still stand tall. In comparison to them, I am seeing nothing. Shame on me. Shame on me. Shame on me if I were to commit suicide. May it never be that I shame Jesus, blaspheme Jesus, and fail Jesus. May my life and my death bring Jesus glory. And may the Holy Spirit help me to truly be in love with him. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So don't ever think that, brother. I'm not tired because I want to end it. I'm just tired like, okay, what's next? Do I have to go to jail? So if I'm gone for a while, no, because this judge threw me in prison. Please, no. This, the, the prison system in Chicago sucks. But anyway, pray for favor here, okay? Scott, well then. The Jesus in me and in you will save me from that. And the Lord Jesus comfort you and your family. Okay? Love you guys. Lord willing, I'll see you. I'll try to do a show tomorrow. It's Saturday. But look for me, all right? Thank you for allowing me to open my heart. Now, people are going to hear this, and the Muslims are going to use it to bash me. I don't care. As long as Jesus loves me, all right? Thank you, Zena. Only an Assyrian sister would say, and oh, by the way, it was her brother who said, hey, you can convert people in prison. Gee, I'm so glad that you're excited for me to go to prison and preach. Hey, hey, how about this? Why don't you go to prison and preach and send me a postcard? Man, dude, if this is love, then I don't want to choose Jesus. Keep it to yourself, bro. But I love you guys, right? And do pray for my daughters. God bless you. Re-listen to these sessions. Let me repeat again. Let me end it with this. I promise you, if you go back, and re-listen to these sessions on Jesus being firstborn. Here's my promise. No anti-Trinitarian will be able to refute you if he or she uses honest, accurate methods of interpretation because the evidence is overwhelming and irrefutable that the God revealed in the Bible, who is God, who is real, is triuna, Jesus is God Almighty. Okay? That's my promise. They're going to tap dance. They're going to deny. They're going to pervert or ignore. That's all they can do. Oh, by the way, Michelle, you want to hear something funny? My ex-wife's name is Michelle. So keep her in prayer that she'll repent and fear the Lord and turn back to Christ. Because after all, she's still the mother of my kids. And she is a creature of Christ that Christ died for. So Michelle, my ex-wife's name is Michelle. So remember that. And oh, Becca, Becca. Her last name is Gabriel. Her last name is Gabriel. Irony of ironies. And Jesus, listen, this is the truth. No matter how I may feel towards her, one thing I want you to remember, Jesus loves her because Jesus created her for his glory, died to save her, no matter how I feel. And I have to remember that because it's not about me. It's not about her. This hatred, this animosity, these attacks are temporary because both her and I will, will die, must die, and we will stand before Jesus. And then when I stand before Christ, all she did to me won't matter for anything. All right? So remember that. Love you guys. Take care.